as I'm going through. Good morning. How are you guys doing? Very cool. Hey, how are you guys doing? Very cool. Um, yeah, so I always know during conferences, because I do with lots of conferences, I always know when they switch to English that I'm about to go up. It's like, it's very nice. Thank you. I could do this in Estonian. I could do one slide. It would take the full 20 minutes, and you guys would be laughing your asses off. I've done it before. So I, I do that just purely for entertainment, so I'm not going to even try to do that today. Um, it's a big question. I'll get to a little bit more detail on that in a second. So yes, first thing, I have a dog. When I first got to Estonia, and uh, especially the media, found out that I had a dog, uh, and a husky in particular, um, literally, they didn't really care if I showed up for photo shoots. They just cared that the dog did. If I did a photo shoot, they'd be going like, hey, is Lucky, that's his name, Lucky. They'd be, is Lucky coming? I'm like, yeah, Lucky's here. So every photo I've got from media actually has Lucky, my dog, in there. And yeah, I am from Teletoot, cool. If you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, you can just do the phone thing, and although you're not supposed to be using phones, I heard, but okay. You can also do Chris Robbins Estonia, and I'm the only one on LinkedIn, so that works as well, which is cool, and there's a bunch of stuff there. Yeah, I didn't know, you did some research. Um, so these are my values, actually. There's four of them, even though it only looks like two. Um, and the first one is actually inner strength and personal development and personal growth and all those kinds of things. So it is kind of a passion topic for me, which is cool. And sorry for the guys with the cameras, because yeah, I do tend to move around a little bit. It's all good. Okay, I'll try and contact. I've only had one coffee today. So I, I should be fairly decent. So what to learn and teach for success. It's such a broad topic and it sounds so absolutely ambitious and to do it in 20 minutes is like a little bit crazy. So I thought I'd throw in meaning of life into there as well. Just, you know, add a little bit more depth to it, which is kind of fun. I love to read. I don't know, I imagine you guys in the industry and you love to read as well, but um, there's a book literally called uh, Meaning of Life. I want to say 2006, 2007, and I can't think of the guy's name that wrote it, but I bought the book. It was one of the last physical books I bought. I usually buy digital books. Um, just because I love the title. Like anybody that has the balls to actually say meaning of life, and he's going to give it to you in a book. And to be fair, in the guy's book, first chapter, he explains what he thinks the meaning of life is, which is kind of cool. So I'm going to kind of model that. <laughs> I'm going to answer this question really, really quickly. I, I get asked this question a lot. I get the opportunity to talk to students a lot, um, especially business students and economic students and those things. And uh, first time uh, people coming into the organization, I meet all new people coming into the organization. So I get this question a lot. And this is my standard answer. So it sounds like an incredibly broad topic, but I always say, and I've been saying this for probably 15 years, if not more, Communication and psychology, which goes against what most companies usually end up teaching and training internally. I absolutely believe this is fundamental for businesses. Everything we do in business comes down to communication and psychology. You do sales, communication, psychology. You do marketing, communication, psychology. You do management of people, leadership. Anything you do in an organization is communication and psychology. You are the most, have the greatest ideas in the world. I'm strong on ideation. I love coming up with ideas. You can come up with the best ideas on the planet. If you can't communicate those ideas, they're not going to happen. If you can't get people behind those ideas, they're not going to happen. So it's more than just the ideation. You actually need the communication and psychology, which is why I always say this is the areas you need to focus on. Actually, the very first person I ever talked to in Teletu Estonia, actually, I guess the second, because the guy that hired me, first person I talked to was our onboarding kind of guy. He's, he does psychology, and he's our trainer and everything else. First question he asked me was this, and that was my answer. Now, it worked well that he actually had training in psychology and communication, so we hit it off. That was very, very cool. The other thing with this, which I find stunning, but it's a, a potential benefit for people, is that in business schools, they still don't teach this. It is fundamental to everything in business, yet you're still not taught it in business schools. And to be fair, most people in businesses don't know crap about this. So it differentiates you. So great, go to business school and get you know, the marketing and the finance and all the rest of the stuff that you need because everybody else has that, but it doesn't differentiate you. You learn communication and psychology, it differentiates you. So this is like a passion topic. I read, I don't know, 25, 30 books a, a, a year probably. I was gonna say a week, that'd be impressive, but no. <laughs> a year, um, and most of them, I'd say 70% of them are on those topics, so. So I could just stop there and go to, straight to questions, but no. So I did pick a couple of key topics. These aren't like necessarily the most important topics in these two fields. They're just ones that I, I kind of like, so they're, they're what's the word? It's uh, they're representative, not exhaustive. Yeah? So first one under psychology. First thing we should be teaching everybody in an organization is how people's brains work, how we make decisions. 
Okay, I'm just looking around. Everybody in this room is human. Yes? Yeah, fantastic, very, very cool. So guess what? Our brains are screwed up. We don't make decisions rationally. We make them emotionally, we justify them rationally. But people don't accept that. Still debates about this. It's been proven for decades and decades and decades. There's literally, I love numbers. I'm an ex-finance guy too. And all of the stuff I talk about, while it sounds to some people very soft and fluffy, there is a real business benefit to all of this stuff, which is what I also love it, because it that, hits that rational side of my brain. So two numbers. You guys know what a cognitive bias is? Have you ever heard of that? Okay. Oh, good. Fantastic. I'm talking to the right room. So cognitive bias is essentially ways that our brains don't make sense. They, they don't make, we don't make decisions rationally. There are over 200 identified cognitive biases for humans, depending on how you're counting them and everything else. So identified, studied cognitive biases, ways our brains don't work rationally. Yeah? We need to understand that if you're in business, again, I don't care what, what area of business you're in, what function of business you're in, you need to understand how people's brains work. It's not rational. You need to understand how they make decisions. These cognitive biases, and we all know these things, it's like confirmation bias, anchoring. There's a guy, behavioral psychologist, I always get his name wrong. Uh, there's two of them actually, but I can ne never pronounce his partner's name. I think it was Kahneman in like uh, 1970s. So behavioral psychologist did some ph phenomenal uh, work, uh, studies and different things with his partner around how humans make decisions. I think it was, one was on the anchoring effect and one's called uh, prospect theory. He won a Nobel Prize in economics. Behavioral psychologist won a Nobel Prize in economics in 2002 for the work he did in the 1970s around these, co these cognitive biases that people have. So literally, he was even recognized, economics, it's kind of business, recognized in business that these things had a huge, important impact on business. And all of the economists around the world hated the fact that the psychologist actually, because it's been a debate literally since like the 40s or 50s between economists who are rational. When I went to school, we learned like rational pricing theory and rational market theory and all the rest of this crap doesn't actually work. And so there's this big, this big group of economists that believe, yeah, it's all still rational, it works rationally, humans don't. Oh, the 20 is just if you categorize those 20, those 200 into different categories, there's about 20 different categories. Like anchoring effect, I think there's 10 or 12 different screwed up ways that our brains make sense. So I'm not gonna go into all of those. <laughs> just that would be a topic if I was gonna pick topics to teach people coming into an organization, how humans make decisions would be one of them. Because I love books and just to really screw up your papers probably because I doubt that they could kind of do animations on the papers. Um, I've actually thrown in some book recommendations as we go through. Actually, the one I missed, the one by Kahneman, it's called uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, where he actually goes through most of this stuff. Fast, fascinating book. These two are pretty good as well. Um, the first one's a little bit controversial because apparently Ariel dude stole all the information from other people. I don't care. The content's good. Well, I should care, but anyways, it's a good book. Uh, Decisive Moment, again, a really, really good book if you want to get into this stuff. It's, it's almost an endless category, though, so you can spend a lot of time, but I'd say one area to focus on in psychology for training and development, how humans make decisions. The other one is personal growth. Okay, so we, Intelligent, just kind of started to get into this. Every company I know of, probably, trains functional skills. We were doing that as well when I got there. We were training for sales skills and customer care and all those different functional skills, if you will. We started about two years ago really focusing on personal development. And this isn't really surprising that we should be focusing on personal development inside the organization. And when I say personal development, I don't care what it is. You want to learn needlepoint? Fantastic. You want to learn how to sail? Fantastic. Fly? Fantastic. I don't care. It's not about what the person's learning, it's about the fact that humans like to develop. When humans are developing themselves, they are happier, they're more confident, they're more effective, they're more efficient. All of those things are a benefit for organizations. So I don't care what the person is doing in terms of personal growth, I just want them growing and developing and, and being happy. I'll talk about happiness in a second too. So personal growth, I didn't give any book recommendations, I don't think, for this one because there's like an unlimited amount there. So yeah. Something we did wrong, as I just explained. So we actually had you know, functional training and we've added on, essentially, personal development training for people, anything they want to do. Our target is four hours a week for anybody, doesn't matter what they want to learn, we, we need to support that. We haven't achieved it yet because we haven't figured out how the hell to do it for, for certain areas, but we're working at it, that's our objective, it's a good thing. Uh, but truthfully to me, I think the way we did it was kind of ass backwards. It should actually be the basis for all internal training and then the functional stuff on top of it. But Okay, 
Self-awareness. Okay, I know with this room, everybody has read like EQ books. Yeah? Everybody knows emotional intelligence? Yes? Okay, fantastic. Yay, not head snotting. I thought it was really weird that there's like reserved seats in the back. It doesn't usually happen like reserved seats are in the front. But it's okay. I was going to ask you guys, but it's okay. Um, so self-awareness. Do you guys remember, if, if you can think of the book, in the book, they talk about self-awareness, uh, self-management, I think it is. Social awareness, social management, something like that. There's four different quadrants. So self-awareness is part of emotional intelligence. I would also say teach emotional intelligence to everybody in the organization. I've literally handed out books on emotional intelligence to all kinds of people that I've met and that I've worked with and worked for, for very directive reasons. If you met those people, you would know what I'm talking about. They definitely needed books on emotional intelligence. But self-awareness is one part of that, and it's kind of foundational to emotional intelligence. And why I love this topic is because of, again, numbers. I said, I've given out uh, emotional intelligence books to, like I said, probably hundreds of people by now, yeah? When I ask them about self-awareness, I would say 90% of people that I've given those books to said, yeah, I'm pretty good on self-awareness. I, I know myself pretty well, you know, good to great kind of thing in terms of self-awareness, yeah? So there's a lady, oh, I almost said her name, her first name's Tasha, for some reason I remember that. It's one of the book recommendations. Yurik, Tasha Yurik. She's really, really super focused, this, uh, studied this area. Uh, they've done meta-analysis and qualitative and quantitative analysis. And when they asked people, and usually in the business segment, when they asked people, how are you for self-awareness? Yeah, 95% of people said they had a good level of self-awareness. Okay, that's high. Anytime, again, going back to humans aren't rational, anytime you think that uh, anytime 95% of people say something, you could almost be guaranteed it's not true. There's no way it could be absolutely true. So 95% of people said they were. Then they went out, which is a good question, and talked to the people that worked with them. Family, friends, did the 365, and asked, I think it was four or five different questions to get a better sense on does this person have good self-awareness? Yeah? That's the number. 10% of people, actually, actually, to be fair, it's 10 to 15, but that looks more dramatic. 10% of people actually have a good level of self-awareness. The really scary part about this, and if you've worked with different levels in organizations, you guys have experienced this. If you're a first-time manager and you're saying, yeah, you know, maybe 80% of first-time managers are saying, yeah, I've got a pretty good level of self-awareness, okay? It means they're not developing it because they believe they have a good level of self-awareness. They're not doing anything. They're not asking the why questions, the what questions to develop it further because they think they're already pretty good at it. What happens is that they go up and they get more experience and they move up in the organization, they get to that 95% and they still haven't friggin' well fixed it. It's delusional. They think they're great at self-awareness and they're crap at self-awareness. And the higher you get up in the organization, the more delusional you are, which I know all of you guys would agree with. <laughs> As a CEO, I can make fun of CEOs, it's kind of fun. So self-awareness would be a super, super key area I'd, I'd focus on training and development. Yeah, she wrote a book actually after all of the research she did called Insight. It's a decent one and Mindsets is, eh, it's not as bad. I really liked hers and truth, you do a Google search on self-awareness, there's dozens and dozens of books you can read on it. So it's kind of cool. So self-awareness, happiness. I love this topic. Yes, you can train people on happiness. You can develop people on happiness. We had a leadership team meeting, my direct leadership team meeting just last week and we got into this conversation about, well, you can't, teach people happiness. Yes, you can. It's probably the easiest topic you can actually help people with. Okay? Everybody's like, oh, it's... Okay. You want to teach people happiness? Sleep. Quality and quantity of sleep. Help people out with that. Nutrition. Nutrition you have to be careful with because it's incredibly polarizing, but bring in a whole bunch of different people talking at different topics. There's some things that people can agree on when it comes to nutrition. Um, fitness. Anything around fitness. People are healthier. Guess what? They're happier. Not rocket science. Um, some more of the softer stuff, meditation. Eh, that, that turns a lot of people off if you use that word, so think of different words. Mindfulness, again, truthfully, a lot of people will just drop it because it's oh, that's all like that touchy-feely creep. Little secret, tell them it's focus. You're going to train them on focus, same thing as mindfulness, and they go, oh, okay, I get it. Again, communication psychology. You want the audience to like take it on? Eh, call it something different. On focus, there's a 2010, 2011 paper I can't think of the guy's name, it fits, no, that's not it. I'm just gonna make up a name. <laughs> um, it's called a, oh, I almost had it. Um, cluttered mind or something, or uh, a, a distracted mind is an unhappy mind, that was it. So 2010, 2000 thing is uh, published in science uh, paper, where they literally, 
uh, they did a whole bunch of things with smartphones and asking people questions and whatever else. They found that when somebody was working on an activity and they were distracted from that activity, they were unhappy. And the super, maybe that's, that's not like a huge like insight. The cool thing though was, if they were working on something that they didn't like, and they were distracted, they were thinking about something that they did like, they were also unhappy. So it wasn't what they were doing or what they were thinking about, it was are they focused on what they're doing or are they distracted from it? And being distracted from what you're doing actually causes unhappiness. So literally, you teach people focus, you'll create happiness. So again, this is, I get so touchy feeling, people are like, oh no, 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 no. You know, you can't teach happiness and it's not in the scope of what companies should be doing. It's like dead center in scope of what companies should be doing. It's teaching people to be happy. Because truthfully, I'd rather if everybody in the company working for it with me is like happy. That would be a good thing. And to be happy for customers. And you guys all know you walk into any organization and if the person you're dealing with is unhappy, you know the second you walk into that store, go into any government office, and hopefully there's no government people here, any government office, you know if those people love their job or hate their job, you can tell instantly, I would rather have happy people and we should be training and developing people for it. So happiness. These are like really, really big, broad books. That first book, any time I can recommend it, I always do. Most people have read it, which is a good thing. Anything by the Dalai Lama. If you're talking about happiness, I think I throw up anything in the Dalai Lama is good. And the last book is actually more fun, more digestible, um, but it's decent on that too. And truth again, do a Google search on books and happiness. You've got an unlimited list that you can go from. Okay, again, not exhaustive list on psychology. It's a broad, 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 broad topic, but those would be kind of a few areas that I'd focus on. Communication, I love this quote because it is so, so super common. There's still, to this day, I think this was like two, three years ago, it might have been a little bit more, there was a, a, an example of a CEO, uh, headquarters in New York, he lived in New York. You would, if I could think of the company name, you would recognize it, big, massive company. He's famous for doing an email at like three o'clock in the morning. I don't know what, if you like, actually wrote it at three o'clock in the morning or if he sent it, anyways. Sent it off to everybody at three o'clock in the morning with a change in the direction for the company. It's actually talked about as good communication, I guess because it was like three o'clock in the morning or some stupid reason. Sending off one email on the change in company strategy is not good communication. It's crappy communication. But he thinks, hey, my job's done. I've communicated. Holy crap. Super common mistake among people is, I'll send off an email and everybody will be aligned and everybody will be moving in the right direction. It's crap. When I think of communication, I always think of three stages. Awareness, understanding, and alignment. What that means is like the first 20 times I talk about something, all I'm going for is awareness, that the people I'm talking to are a little bit aware of the topic. The next like 20, 30 times, they're starting to get some level of understanding. Then after those like 50, 60 times, I'm starting to focus on alignment for people. It's not a one and done thing. So really, really big problem, especially in business. Okay, so again, just some key topics around communication that I would say focus on. Listening skills. So back to the self-awareness, I suck at this. Um, I've studied it, I've read about it, I learned about it, I know about it, but you guys can tell I like to talk. Um, and so I literally have taught listening skills to people. Um, but I always have to kick myself in the ass to remind myself to actually do it at times. I actually have to go into it. So that self-awareness is useful for some things, but listening skills, hugely, hugely important. I had um, a guy that worked for me in Lithuania, actually. Amazing guy, brilliant ideas. It goes back to my, my first example, brilliant ideation guy. But he couldn't tell when he was giving his ideas that everybody shut down because of the way he was communicating. So two problems with that. He didn't know how to communicate to people and he wasn't watching and listening how people reacted. And it used to drive me nuts because he had such great ideas and I could tell looking at people listening to him that they were shut off, they were closed off, they weren't paying any attention. And he didn't see it. So I started working with him. I gave him a bunch of resources, everything else, working with him on those listening skills. Now, he felt a little bit uncomfortable using those listening skills and practicing them with his, like, his colleagues and his, the people that work for, uh, for him. So I said, well, do them at home. Yeah, it makes sense. We'll practice at home, a little bit lower risk uh, environment. So he did. He started trying to practice these things at home. I have to admit, I won't give his name, but I have to admit he didn't get much better in the office to be fair, <laughs> he, was, he, was a, he was a difficult person to coach from that perspective. Did in some areas, not in this one. Uh, but we had an event about three or four months after he started doing some of this training, and it was like a family event. And his wife came up to me and thanked me for 
teaching him listening skills because he'd been practicing at home and it was working at home and she was like super happy that he was now listening and had these listening skills and I was like okay that made my year essentially so it's kind of cool so there's bigger impacts beyond just just work but listening skills definitely teach it um all of those really really good books the last one I, I think is fascinating it's really niche ish so what everybody is saying that guy is an ex-fbi interrogator what I found, and it sounds bizarre, but with communication psychology topics, I love reading materials, content, from uh, ex-special forces, uh, ex-military, or that's military, uh, ex-police, ex-FBI guys, these types of guys. I think, I was trying to figure out why I like this books or why they're good, or at least my opinion they're good. I think if you're, it's life and death situations, and you have to worry about, and you have to be focused on communication psychology, you get damn good at it, or you're dead. So the filtering process for authors is pretty good because essentially if you survive, you must be pretty good at that so you can write books on it. That's my theory at least. But it's a really, really good book. Okay, write personality and communication. So this one maybe doesn't sound obvious, but um, first of all, I'll jump to the, the bottom right one. So for me, anybody that works with me know I'm, I'm like crazy focused on authenticity. I don't know how to explain this, and there's probably research, and there's probably studies around it, but my fundamental belief is that people know when you're being authentic. They know if it's a script. They know if it's just you've been told to say these things, if you're following a process. So as much as possible, I don't, strangely enough, I don't like process. I definitely don't like scripts. It's bizarre. You hire people and you say, talk to people like you're, they're your friend, and then you give them a script. I don't know anybody that needs a script to talk to a friend. It's bizarre. But authentic communication is like the, the, the key thing. Within that, though, respect, confidence, empathy, friendliness. I've talked to presidents, prime ministers, ministers, government people, customer-facing people. I've talked to like a wide group of people. I still talk in the same way. I'm still going to be friendly. I'm still going to be empathetic. I'm still going to communicate in that kind of a tone of voice because it's authentic. But people need to be te taught that and trained that and figure that out. So one. The other one doesn't exactly fit into personality, but it's one of my, again, one of my favorite topics. P powerful questions. Asking powerful questions. And again, this is one of those areas that I suck at. So I know I'm not supposed to ask questions in a certain way, but I still do. I know better, so I always have to be reminding myself, don't do it that way. And I coach people, and then I'll go to the next meeting after I've coached somebody not to not ask powerful questions, and then I'll go and do it myself. So it's definitely an area of focus. Powerful questions, and this happens all the time in business. I'm sure you guys have had it. Somebody walks into a group, and they're going to be presenting an idea. Yeah? So everybody's listening to the idea, whatever else. And then somebody, usually like somebody like me or somebody else in the room will go, you really think that's a good idea? Now... It has a question mark at the end of it, technically. I framed it in the sense of a question, but I'm not actually asking a question when I say that. And the person knows I'm not asking a question when I say it that way. What happens to them, psychology? They get defensive, their brain shuts down, goes into like pure reactive mode. So you want them to think and answer that question, but their brain is literally working the other way. Asking questions like that is stupid because literally you're getting the exact opposite reaction that you want from that person. Now, I could say, hey, you know, based on my experience, I don't see how you're going to get those results. Why do you think you're going to get those results? Rephrase the question in a different way, and the person's not going to be as defensive. They're not going to shut down as much. They might think about it. You've given your explanation for why you might not agree with that direction. Now, you explain to me why you think that way. It's asking powerful questions. And the psychology behind it is you get a completely different emotional and, and physical response from the person. So super, super important one. Okay, I don't, I found this online. I thought it was super, super funny. I have no idea where it came from, but it is like really funny. Suggestions you really believe what you just said. I'm gonna look it up sometime and figure out. Every single person in the room, probably more in personal relationships, sometimes in business relationships, have said something like, you didn't hear what I said. Yeah, hear that a lot? Okay, that's stupid, again. So if you're the one communicating, your objective is what is the person hearing? Not what you said. I don't care what the hell you said. What I care about is what the person heard coming out of that. And again, in business, oh my God, it happens all the time. Even for a leadership team, you know, we'll spend so much time focused on what's the message. And we do the message. And then the next day we get feedback. Oh, somebody thought it meant this and somebody thought it meant that. And these guys were upset about this. And it's like, oh my God. So I've learned a couple things. One, really, really focus on this. The other one is you can't please everybody with communication. 
which is why you need to do it again and again and again and again. It's not a one and done type of thing. So it's not about what you say, it's about what they hear, which again goes back to listening and asking questions and asking powerful questions. You need to be checking in. What did the person hear? What you said might not be what that person heard. So check in with them, make sure that it is. Super, super important area. Okay, and I think, actually this is last, so I'm almost on time. Holy crap, oh well, anyways. <laughs> so many different methods out there now, and today's virtual and physical and everything else is getting just crazy. And most organizations, including ours actually, haven't tried to start to teach people which ones to use when. Which tools to use when for what type of communication, what's best. It's cultural to a certain extent, so I mean country culture, it's more company culture. But I still think this is a huge area in communication that we need to be focusing on the actual method of communication as well. Yeah? And teaching and training the method of communication. Don't have any great books for this because actually we're just getting into this and I'm just getting into this, but super, super uh, interesting. And I've got visual up there twice, I think. Yeah, anyways, the time's 100. The last point I'll make. Um, I had a great friend, mentor, coach um, that literally, he was the guy that told me this. You have to say something 100 times before people start to get it. You're literally sick of talking about something, and that's just about the time that everybody has gotten to that awareness and alignment stage that I was talking about. Literally takes 100 times. And I say this explicitly to people. So in the company, we joke around that, okay, well, I've said this like 92 times. Feels like 100, but not quite. I've said it 92 times, and yeah, I've got a few more to go. So you just keep on talking about it, keep on talking about it, keep on talking about it. And, and yeah, anyways. And... Oh, okay, there's this one too, which is probably in your book, so some reading recommendations. Or send me, like I said, connect on LinkedIn. I've got a massive list of reading recommendations, but those are some good ones. And that's not my puppy dog, by the way, but it was super cute, so. That's Make it. your applause for the first to Chris. <laughs> <laughs> so let's start with the questions. Uh, please raise up your hand and uh, we give you the mic. Or if you have the loud voice, uh, we don't <coughs> use the mic then. Uh, I will kick off and then maybe they warm up a little bit. So Please. My, first, my first day in Estonia, I was told, because I did a, 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 what you, like an open conversation with all of the employees, and th I was told that the average Estonian asks 0 0.4 questions in their lifetime. Chris, the I don't know if that's true, but I love it. Chris, the question is, uh, <laughs> on, on, on tomorrow morning, yes. Friday in the uh, Tele2 office, uh, you're going to the uh, finance uh, division. Yep. And there are guys uh, cracking the numbers. And you are in the hand uh, of the book about EQ, yep. emotion and intelligence. And you are saying that, please, guys, be with a high energy, motivated, and please read this book. And they have empty glass. Yeah. A little bit lower energy. So, how you do that? <laughs> I'm ex-finance, so I, I can make fun of finance. You are not the, the average finance guy. I don't know if that's true or not, but it's okay. <laughs> so, how you do that? Uh, literally, uh, again, part of it is communication. So, for me, I need to know what that person is important. What's important to that person? So, if I'm going up to an individual person and I'm giving them an EQ book, it's usually because I've identified a gap somewhere, or maybe an opportunity or potential for them. I'm going to explain that to them. So it's like, hey, you know what? I know you're doing this all the time, but when I see you talking about numbers, you're seeing the big picture. And to see the big picture, you need to have an impact on the broader organization. So part of EQ is literally that societal management and societal awareness. For you, I think that would be phenomenal. So I, I don't go to like an entire functional team and say, read this book on EQ because it's good. I do sometimes with managers, if there's good content like this, where I try and get it across, but managers are usually motivated. If I was doing it for an individual though, I explain why I'm giving them the book and what's the benefit mm. of it. So okay. literally, it's any topic. Why? Truthfully. Why yeah. is important? Okay. Yeah, for sure. But make please it personal. Raise yeah, again, hand there has to be for a the question. For them, so. Yes, please. Back there, Preet. Yes. Uh, thanks, Chris, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, one provocative question. On a scale of 1 to 10, how do you um, evaluate your self-awareness? <laughs> and then a, a follow-up question as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Two. Um, I, I am... I, one of my other values is learning. So I'm constantly learning. I love learning. So I also believe I have to learn about myself and psychology. First place you have to start is yourself. So all of the psychology topics, not all, but most of the psychology topics I learn about is about me. So versus other people, I would say I'm higher because <laughs> I've spent all that time. I'm still not self-aware now. Yeah. But then uh, the other question is about the organization. You mentioned that, uh, and thank you for the answer as well, mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, uh, the personal development mm. is sort of uh, not an add-on, it's a foundation that you want to build on. Mm. Um, 
how does it kind of, how's the adoption in your organization of, are people actually uh, picking up on that? And, and what types of things are they mm. then choosing to develop themselves on? Wow, that's a great question. Mm. So the short answer would be no. Um, very, very small adoption rate, and that's for two reasons. One is that the people themselves, like the, the broader organization, the broader population, doesn't really believe it because it's so out there in terms of, so you're telling me you're going to support me to learn anything. So we'll do it once or twice and then try and champion those stories and talk about them all the time and everything else. But people don't believe it on one hand. And then truthfully, the biggest obstacle is managers because managers don't want to do it. Mm. They're like, why am I spending time and money and rescheduling people so that they can learn how to like sail a ship? So it's me talking to them constantly about this stuff. Happier people are better at what their jobs and they're better at what they do. So it's, it's a constant struggle though. And from those two levels, it's getting people to believe that we're actually doing it and we're sincere and authentic about it. And then also getting managers the hell out of the way, truthfully, or getting them aligned essentially. Again, I've probably talked about it internally, got some internal people, I don't know, 50 times. So I've got like another 50 times to talk about it before I actually get everybody in the organization aligned, but it's still a, still a struggle. I would Thank say. you. Yeah, thank, you. thank you. More questions? Chris, you mentioned several times coaching. My question is that how alive is the coaching and mentoring in your organization? Holy crap, probably more than any company I've been in before. And, and I would love to take credit for it, but it really is the team that's doing it. Uh, the Mikkel guy I was talking about is fantastic at it. We've got really, really good coaches and mentors that are passionate about it. So I literally, I've never seen anything like it and it's its, it's own life. I don't have to push it. I'm not driving it. It's more than I would expect. Can so that be phenomenal. the open invitation? If there are any companies who are interested in that, how you are doing sure. that so they can con contact you for sure, and, yeah, take no, the and then I'll send them to the right person. <laughs> Let's make the big hand for the Chris. Yeah. Oh my God, cool, Chris. I get stuff too.